Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be in your house uh, uh, again. Lord, you woke us up this morning and you started us on our way. It was your grace and your mercy that moved us today. It was the touch of your fingers that allowed us to move and have our being today. Lord, we thank you for having a sound mind and reasonable health and strength this day. Lord, thank you for allowing us to open up our mouths and have lips to give you praise that only you are worthy of. Father, we thank you for food on our tables, shelter for over our heads, clothing on our back. And Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings you have bestowed upon us, our cars that allow us to even drive and get to our destination. Lord, we thank you that you provided us with all these conveniences, a church house, in which we can safely come without fear or reprobation that someone may do us harm. Yes, and we live in a land where we can open our mouths yes. and declare the name of Jesus and his powerful might. So, Lord, we just ask that you bless each and every one under the sound of my voice. Meet them at their point of need today, Lord. Let there be a divine touch from you that we will learn more of you. And Holy Spirit, yes. have your way. Teach us and guide us and lead us today as we undertake the lesson of look and live. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, Rev, could you do the privilege of reading our lesson of Look and Live, which is coming out of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Oh, you wait to see if anybody else want to volunteer. Let's see if anybody else wants to read the lesson. No, I don't need no mic. <laughs> all right, go ahead there. In the day, Numbers 21, yeah. verse 1. Can everybody hear me? Oh, I hear you real loud and clear. All right, read this part. And when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel bowed and bowed to the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their city. Amen. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their city. And he called the name of the place Homa. And they journeyed from Mount Hall by the way of the Red Sea to come past the land of Egypt. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathed. This light breaks. Ooh, I think and the Lord it. sent fire and among the people, and they bit them, the people, and much people of Israel died. Amen. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, but we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpent from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fire of the serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bent, when he looked upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bread, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of bread, he lived. The Word of God. Thank you, Reverend Simpson, for your powerful reading of the Scripture this morning. So here it is, the title, Look and, and Live. And the Israelites again are in the wilderness. So let's kind of give a little background. Uh, what had happened when they went in originally to uh, look at the land that God had promised them? Uh, he sent uh, 13 people, 12, and they went in to see what the land looked like. That was the instructions they were given. What happened when they came back from their from their report? Anybody want to share what happened when the when the when the twelve came back and had to give their report to Moses and the Israelites 
what the land was like. Yeah, they, the they made, a, made a good report. They said, yes, indeed, it's a fine land. It was, it was it is, glorious. Everything's fine. Yeah. But. But. Woo, the but will get you in trouble. The people are too strong. Uh, here's, the, here's the bad report. Instead of having confidence in God yeah. and what he'd already shown them that he could do for them, they saw with their own eyes these yeah. giants in the land, and they became fearful. And when they became fearful, they came back with a negative report saying that they were too strong and too big that they were not able to take them out. And that angered the Lord because God had already showed them his miraculous power. He had already delivered them from Egypt and had showed many signs and wonders of what he's able to do, parting the Red Sea and all the plagues that they had witnessed and observed as they showed, showed God working on their behalf. It just wasn't enough. But most of the people of Israel to keep their confidence in God and what God was able to do. And they saw with their own eyes the giants. How many times have we got to situations where we've been victorious, with things are going well in our lives, and then problems and troubles come in our lives. And we start to grumble and complain. And we start to blame. And we look for ways in which we can attack and lash out at others. And God is listening to us. He's hearing us complain and uh, ridicule people. He's hearing us saying, we can't do it. Why did God do this to us? Why did he lead us here just to leave us? And we always say, God has brought us a mighty long way. I mean, old folks all say he's brought us a mighty long way. Right. And he brought us too far to just leave us right here. In other words, all these things we've been witnessing and seeing God do on our behalf, and we know it wasn't us that did it. We know it was a power much greater than us. We know the Lord was on our side and we couldn't lose. But now we face another giant in our lives, and we get fearful. We start to have lack of faith and unbelief in what God's able to do. <coughs> and we start grumbling and complaining. That's human nature, isn't it? Because we want to look at the obvious, what we see with our eyes, instead of the things that we need to look at in faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. And every time we turn our eyes away from God and look at our circumstances, it's that's when we get in trouble. Because God is able to do all things exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask. Yes. So the principle of our lesson today is this. To see that no matter how rough life gets, we must always trust the Lord to see us through. No matter how rough life gets, we're going to have some bad days, right? Mm -hmm. There are going to be some situations that come up that's beyond our ability to deal with or to cope with. And we got to remember... That no matter how tough it gets, God is there with us to help us get through it. Amen. And if we don't forget that, we don't have to worry about starting to feel defeated and inadequate that we can't do it. Yes, brother. The problem with the Israelites is also with us. When they came back, they said we were in our own outside of grasshoppers. They saw themselves little. Little, right. Grasshoppers. We the giants. Alive. <laughs> right. We said, I can't do that. We can see ourselves as grasshoppers. Right, right. So in our circumstances, rather than looking at ourselves as capable, strong, and mighty in the Lord, we start looking at us, our own natural abilities. I can't do that. I ain't good enough. Uh, those, those people are much stronger than me. Uh, they got more money than I got. Uh, they got connections. Uh, they, they run things here. They're not going to listen to me in the first place. Uh, I don't have the right background. I don't have enough training. So we can't do it. I mean, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be defeated. So in our minds, we start talking ourselves right out of our victories. Yes, David. Uh, not only uh, did they, like, the Israelites complain about the, the, uh, not being strong enough for that army, but it's funny how they cast it later to say that the 
food is not good enough. And that's just how we do today. You know, one thing is not, you know, we not look working for out, we look for something else. Right. Yep, you're so right. They complain about the manner. Mm -hmm. Angel food, who God brought from heaven, was not good enough for them anymore. Mm -hmm. Although they've been able to live on this diet with no problem. Uh, for all these years, because we're towards the end of their journey now. Right. It's been like 38 years they've been wandering in the wilderness, and they still haven't made it to the promised land. But they're very close. They're right outside the promised land, and they've already to go in, but then the grumbling and the complaining. The food ain't good enough. The water he hasn't provided. And now God is like, what? All the things I've done for you folks, I've provided you with the food and the water to survive, and your complaint. I gave you the clouds by day and the fire by night to guide you and to protect you. And you've seen this every day since you've been out in the wilderness. And now you're going to doubt me? It's like our kids who are never satisfied, right? You can do all the things you've been doing. You've been cleaning them up, wiping them. Uh, they, they, they didn't have, even know, uh, have enough sense to know who they were and we were taking care of them, right? As soon as they get big enough to do what they want to do, they don't. You can't tell them nothing. Yeah, but I'm just taking the kids as an example right now. They're notorious for saying, "I can do it myself." Don't you trust me? Don't treat me like a little kid anymore. And don't let them get to be 18. They all of a sudden think they're grown. You can't really boss me around no more. I'm my own authority now. I, I can make my own decisions, and you just have to just live with it. Not that right, Jeffrey? <laughs> I didn't see Jeffrey up here, but welcome, Jeffrey. Good to see you here, man. All right. It's good to see you. So we get to that point where, you know, we, we want to be the boss. And we already know that. Who's our boss? God is. Jesus Christ is the boss. He's running the show. So we have to realize that no matter how big and bad we think we are, we got a boss that's in control, that's in charge, and who loves us so much, and he does all these miraculous, powerful things for us, and we never, ever should take it for granted. We always must remember, and the point is, we have to look to the Lord always in faith. We can't get to the point where we feel we're sufficient in ourselves that we can do it on our own. The moment we start thinking we can do it on our own and we don't need the Lord is when we run into our brick wall and we hit it hard. And we have to be humbled again to come to our senses to realize that I can't do this on my own. Every time we try to do it on our own, we fail. But God is loving. He's gracious. He's forgiving. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. He knows that we're just made out of dirt. And that we're going to try to do things our way. So he's just waiting for us to fall, to get on our knees, and he's waiting for us, for us to say, God, forgive me because I sinned. And we have to look up and realize where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord. It always comes from the Lord. All right, let's get into the lesson so that we can break this down. And are there any questions and comments about the lesson before we really get into this stood out as you were reading the scriptures out of Numbers 1 through 9, chapter 21. Yes, Brett. What, brought, what really brought about the complaint was God was leading him the long way around. Yep. See, God saw the Edomites that is. Yeah, they were. And uh, so he decided to leave, and then they, they didn't want to go that way. So they complained about that way, and then they brought up the bread and the water. So we have to realize that God knows best. Oh, thank you. He always right. leads us in the right path. Right, exactly. But we always complain. <laughs> like we feel like we know more than God. <laughs> yeah, isn't that a characteristic about our walk with, in, in, with the Lord? Is that we'll trust Him to a, a certain point, and then when things get a little rough, in the case of the Israelites, they didn't want to go back the long way. They knew they was going to go back towards the Red Sea. They had already left the Red Sea. And they were saying, this is one of their most common, sarcastic remarks that they would throw out at God. They say, why did you take us out of Egypt just for us to die in the wilderness? That's, they were being smart. 
That, that was just being a nasty, smart attitude they had. And they knew they were being sarcastic. It wasn't like, oh, Lord, are we going to die in the wilderness? No, they were actually being belligerent. They were being just hostile. They were being really uh, unfaithful to God. They were actually just being defiant. So in their sarcasm, they were saying, you, you ain't the God that you say you are. You, you said you was going to get us to the promised land, but we don't believe you anymore. So we have a right to complain, and we have a right to, to not want to be obedient to you any longer. And they complained to, to Moses, too. What does God? It was giving Moses the blues. Can you imagine, Pastor, to our Pastor Bobby McKenzie, having to uh, talk to us about some of the things that we complain about? Does, does, does he know that we're complaining? That we got all against our neighbors? against some of our church members, against some people that you might work with on your job, some of your friends, some of your family members. <laughs> we complain, don't we? Yeah. Probably a day doesn't go by we don't find some complaint or something that we're upset about. Let's be real. It's human nature to want to just always knock somebody else down and build ourselves up. We're, we're the knights in shining armor and the women that can do no wrong. <laughs> Say what? The yeah, women can, they can do no wrong. <laughs> yes, then. Uh, those the ones that he sent out to, uh, to scout, yeah. were we assume that those were disciples? Those were not disciples. They were one member of each tribe. Yeah, the head of each tribe. They all went out. So all 12 tribes had a representative. So when they came back, the only two that was, uh, was Caleb. Caleb came back. He was one of them. And, he, and Joshua, and they gave the good report. They was ready to go in there and take the land because they had faith in God because God was going to do it. They weren't relying on their strength. They were relying on the power that God had already displayed up until this point. Plus their reputation had already reached to these, these uh uh, pagan nations, they had heard about what the Israelites had done with the Egyptians. That they were able to get out through the Red Sea and that the Egyptians' armies was destroyed by God. And that he was walking through the, through the desert. They already knew the power of the Israelites. They was afraid of them. They were terrified that they were coming. All they had to do was just walk on up in there and they was going to surrender. They were ready to surrender because they had already heard. Their reputation came before them. Don't you know that some people that you're afraid of, is, you haven't seen what they've done. You just heard about it. And when they show up, you're already scared. They ain't had to do nothing but just show up. That's how Albion used to be when they used to go to the, the, the towns around uh, Albion. Mount Creek, Jackson, Calvary. They used to be afraid of Albion. Them brothers in Albion coming. They just start trembling. <laughs> they didn't have to do nothing. It's the reputation. And, and the Israelites' reputation was well known among these pagan nations. But they were afraid about what they said. They saw the giants in the land. They saw these people looking like Shaq, and all of them was big and strong and powerful. And to, like Pastor said, they looked like red grasshoppers in their eyes. And then they were scared. They didn't have to do the fighting, no. They just had to have faith that God was going to do again what he has been doing for them all these years, and they all they had to do was to trust that God was going to do it. But how many times do we stop trusting God? We've gone through some tough times. It's been years. I haven't got my breakthrough yet. I've given God one more day. If he don't do it in today, I'm finished. I'm going to plan B. Plan ain't God ain't working. But you're alive. You're well. You're in your reasonable health and strength. You got all your basic needs being met. You just don't have some of the wants that you desire. Things ain't worked out in every area of your life. And you start thinking God has betrayed you. God has let you down. And all God is doing is taking care of you each and every day. You got enough to eat breath in your lungs, you got all your basic needs being met, but you're not satisfied. Isn't it easy to get discontent? 
Is it easy because your car that you have ain't good enough, you want a new one? It's riding perfectly well, but it's old. But it still gets you from point A to point B. But you saw your neighbor with a new one, so you want one too. You want to keep up with the Joneses. It don't look good to be riding a beat up old car when everybody's driving nice new ones. Until the new one breaks down and you got to catch a ride with somebody else. So we have a thing about just not ever being satisfied. We always want more. And when God's providing for us, we still find some reason to want to lash out at him, to, to, to distrust him. And that's our human nature. God knows how we are. He knows we're going to be that way. That's why he gives us grace and mercy. If it wasn't for grace and mercy, folks, we all would not have been here today. So let's go on. So God's going to give the victory to the King Arab of Canaan that took some of the Israelites prisoners. So he's, he, they made a, what they call a preemptive strike. They heard about them coming. So what he does, the king says, oh, okay, I'm going to send some of my troop out there. We're going to attack them. And they took, took, the, took the victory, and they took some of the Israelites as, as, as prisoners. So now they're starting to shake a little bit because, they're, because their foundation's been shaking. So now they're going to go to Moses, and they're going to ask Moses to help them out. So what is that? What happens? Israel makes a vow to God that if they deliver the Canaanites to them, they would go in and destroy the cities. So Moses prayed. Ask for forgiveness, and it's exactly God did exactly what he promised to do. Is God true to his word? Amen. All the time. God doesn't break his promises. But it's very important that we remember that when we make a vow to God, he expects us to keep our vows. He expects us to keep our promises. And how many times have we promised God, if you get me out of this particular mess, <laughs> I promise you, God, I, I won't do it again. Boy, if I was so guilty, I thought every night that was my prayer almost when I was a kid. If you don't get me out, if you get me out of this door, I promise I won't let that happen again. Same night, I'm, I'm doing the same thing, same prayer. I said, God must get tired of hearing this prayer from me. Because he knows I don't need it. <laughs> I'm just conveniently asking. And I know I'm not the only one like that. And I'm sure you guys have found yourself in the same situation where you have promised God you weren't going to do something. You weren't going to be with that certain person. Or you weren't going to go to this certain place. Or you weren't going to hang out with so-and-so. And you find yourself, right, the next day, doing the same thing you said you weren't going to do. And you know the people ain't good for you. You know the place that you're going to hang out ain't going to be a good place to hang out. You know no good is going to come out of it. But you know what? It's exciting. It's, you, like, you like the atmosphere. You love the people. It's a lot of fun. It's never boring. And so you end up finding yourself right in the midst of that situation all over again. So here they are. God decides that he's going to help them out. He's going to give them of their sins. And uh, all their disbelief, unbelief, and betrayal. And he's going to give them victory over the Canaanites. So what happens next? He sends uh, serpents. That in itself terrifies me. I hate snakes. <laughs> snakes give me the eebie-jeebies, the creeps. And we know in the garden, that's where our downfall took place with Adam and Eve, the appearance of the serpent. And now the serpent again is going to be a symbol, but this time not of our destruction, but this time the serpent is going to represent our salvation. It says to look and live. So some bad things are going to happen to the Israelites now. Because those serpents that God is going to unleash are going to start lighting them up. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being in this church and we just being attacked by serpents? Mm -hmm. I'd grab my wife and we'd be headed out the back door. <laughs> I wouldn't be concerned about if you're going to follow me. Because I don't like snakes. So my wife don't like snakes. So we'd be out the back door. If you wanted to follow us, you'd be welcome to. But I'm not going to tell you, because I'm going to try to avoid as I can not get bit. So, serpents are coming. So let's get back to the lesson. It says in verse uh, 8. 
And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looked upon it, shall live. What's the comparison here? What can we connect the representation of this serpent on the pole? That's the prophecy of Jesus Christ and Messiah. It's the prophecy of Jesus Christ. Spiritual salvation. The main thing is, these people, all they had to do now that they've been bitten by the serpent, was a lot of them died right there. The serpents caused their death, and they died right on the spot. But some who didn't die, they was in such pain, they wanted to die. They was pleading, oh, Lord, just let me go home. I'm, I, this is too painful. They said it was inflammation, it was burning inside. The pain from the snake bites was, you know, with the venom was causing them such torment. It, most of the people wanted to die. Their only hope, if they had any faith left, was to do what Moses was going to instruct them to do about the serpent. So that's where they are. They're suffering. The, the community has been stricken by serpents. Their family members are dying. The ones who are surviving are in extreme pain. And now Moses has their attention. Doesn't it take tragedy sometimes to get us to see what's going on around us? Does it take a coronavirus to scare the whole world? That God, even though he is still in control, he can send whatever he wants to get our attention. He's still the one that can control the the outcome. But yet, we have to be terrified first. We have to be scared out of our wits. We have to be broken. We have to be humbled before we'll cry out to God again to help us. And this is where the Israelites are. Yes. That's what my leader is doing, trying to scare us all because he don't know nothing. Oh, he's, he's terrified. And he, no, he ain't. And he don't have an answer. He don't. And remember what he said? I alone fix it. <laughs> yeah, he can fix it, all right. Pharaoh. Pharaoh himself sounds just like Pharaoh. God kept bringing more plagues, and it just hardened Pharaoh's heart even more and more every time a plague came. Uh, and it was God's mercy every time. God gave him mercy, he granted him mercy. Okay, Pharaoh, this is the ninth plague. You, do you think it's time for you to humble yourself? God gives him a little more grace. And as soon as he gives him grace, Pharaoh's right back at it again. And this time, God, on the last time, takes Pharaoh's son and all the, all the babies. Do you think that changed Pharaoh's mind? His heart and his heart? No. Pharaoh still had contempt for God. Because he thought he was God. He thought he was God. And he wanted people to worship him. And like Pharaoh, our, our president has a lot of similar traits. <laughs> and he has yet to humble himself. He's yet to say, I'm sorry. You know, yes. You know, they're talking about the older people are the ones that uh, it's easy to get to the virus. Right, the older people. people. Right. Do we think he's young? I don't know. Yeah, he's old. He? And he acts as if though he's going to live forever. He's, he's above But right. age is not even an issue. No. And I don't think he even factored that in. He doesn't. So, but so. The people here, they get back to the leaves of God again. Exactly. So, their whole. Uh, salvation, physical salvation, and our salvation has to do with the same thing. We have to look to Jesus. He's the only road to salvation. It's his blood that we have to look to in order to get saved. There is no other plan that God provided for us. Scripture confirms it. And like you said, this was prophesied in, the, in God's word that he was going to have a serpent on a pole that the people were going to have to cry out to to get healed. Physical healing. We today have to look to the cross that Jesus bled and died for us. His blood was shed on the cross. Why? That cross is the only way we can get saved. And he was hung up like a serpent to die for our sins. And it's the only way we can get our salvation. One way. One road. That's the only way. God is not giving us plan B, plan C. If you don't like the Jesus cross option, then I can let you do this. Try Buddha. He'll work for you. Allah, he's a pretty good God. You should try him out. 
There's all these other options. The Hindus got thousands of different gods that they worship. You can be a Mormon, and that'll work for you. Jehovah Witnesses, try that out. See how that works for you. And God is already telling you, you can try all those other options. They're all going to lead to the same road, death. We as believers, now that we look to the cross, we realize that's our answer. That's our salvation. That's the gift of eternal life that we've been longing to receive. And it's the only way we can get it. There's no other way. And remember how often we tried the other roads? That we don't really need to go down that road? Christians don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Why do we go to church? That's so silly. Stay home and relax. Watch the ball games. Go to the park. Go to the beach. Do your own thing. Go spend some time with your family members. You don't need to be up in church worshiping God. That's for squares. That's for losers. And we know it's not for squares. It's not for losers. Those are for people who are grateful and thankful that God has saved them from their sins. And now they have something that they can never purchase on their own. The gift of eternal life. Everlasting life. Only by the blood of Jesus can we get it. And for the longest, it took me 29 years to figure it out. And I sit up in this church as a little boy all, the, all those years, and I still wouldn't get up and, and accept Christ. I was like, these people, you don't, you don't need to do all that to, to live a decent life. I used to look at people and say, hey, you ain't got to do all that. I see my mom and dad, they seem to be happy sometimes, but they ain't always happy either, so you know that can't be the answer. They're missing something here in this picture. And I don't know if you were looking at your parents and who was going to church, if you were saying the same kind of things that I was saying, well, maybe they don't know something that I know. <laughs> so I fought it until God broke me. I went out into the world thinking I knew something, and the world knew a whole lot more than I knew. And they brought people who I thought I would, could trust into my life. They were like serpents, and they were stinging me. And I felt the pain. It was inflammation all in my body and in my mind till I finally realized that it, I needed to look up. And when I got on my knees, I finally could see where I was missing the big picture. All the time my folks was telling me about Jesus and all the time about them telling us that we needed to come to the Lord. I said, I don't try everything else. I might as well try the Lord now because everything else has failed. And sure enough, when I finally humbled myself, cried out and asked for forgiveness, asked God to take away these crazy situations in my life, God showed up for me. Found me a church that I could be a part of, and it all of a sudden opened the Bible, and I could actually understand what was in the Bible. All of a sudden, the words seemed to just jump out of the Bible. I didn't understand it before because the Holy Spirit has to, to bring it out. When I accepted Christ, then all of a sudden, whoa, Jesus, thank you. Where's that been all these years? It's been there, but I could not interpret it. I couldn't understand it because I didn't have the Spirit. The Bible can't be read like a novel. You need the Holy Spirit in you to be able to understand and comprehend what the Bible is trying to teach you. The Word of God is powerful, but it's not powerful if you don't know Jesus. And Jesus allows you to be able to understand what the Bible is trying to teach you. Thank you, buddy. You might help me. <laughs> okay. So, the Lord sends the serpents. The people now are begging Moses, Moses to do something. They're, they're in desperation. Have you been desperate ever in your life? No. That you're willing to cry out to God? That you say, Lord, just help me this one more time? I, all those other times, you know I wasn't serious. <laughs> but you know I'm serious today. So when I cry out to you tonight, you know I'm not playing around with you. I need your help. And I need a 911 call from you. I need your response to be immediate. So you make that 911 call and God shows up. This time he shows up for the Israelites and says they, were, they had confessed they had sinned against the Lord. They asked for forgiveness. 
And then Moses was told to make that bronze serpent and put it, it and put it on the pole. And all they had to have was a little faith. Just a little faith. And the little faith meant that they had to be able to look up at that serpent on the pole and they would be healed. But if they refused to look up, if they refused to believe that they could get a healing by looking at that bronze serpent, they would die. So those who had a little faith looked and lived. Those who didn't have any faith refused to look and they died. Today, we're faced with the same dilemma. We can look to Jesus and live. Or we can have no faith at all in Jesus and the choice is to die. There's a dying world out there who has no faith in Jesus. That's why we're here on the scene, folks. We have to be able to share the gospel. We have to, even though they may not want to hear it, they're going to reject us, and they said, you know what? I don't want that bread. I don't want that manna. I, I, God, no thank you. They're complaining. They want instant gratification. They want a God that will be their Santa Claus, who will give them their gifts and toys. They don't want a God who says, serve me, because I'm, I'm the Lord. I'm the one who saved you from damnation. That alone should be enough. But we still want more. Most people say, I don't want to have to go to church. Because part of being uh, a Christian means I got to go to church. People are boring. <laughs> you ever been around them? They're boring. They want to pray. They want to read the Bible. They want to tell you about Jesus. I don't want to hear none of that stuff. Yes. I think plus because when you see people in the church and then you see them out in the world and they're totally disobedient, that makes people who might have wanted to come to church think, well, if this is what is what this is going to be church, why should I come to church when I see this? It doesn't help, but they'll find that as a good excuse to do that anyway, because most people who are looking for a reason, they're going to find a reason anyway. So that doesn't help if we're not setting a good example of being what a Christian is like and, 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 and practicing the values and the beliefs of Jesus taught us. So if we are, we don't need to be hypocrites. And we don't need to be putting out a false front saying we're something that we're not. We need to be humble. We need to be grateful. We need to be thankful. We need to be praising God. We need to be telling people how God has delivered us. We need to be sharing our testimonies with people about how God has delivered us from our sins and the differences made in our life. That's what people need to hear. And if you are showing it and living it, then people are going to be more interested and curious to come to the house that you attend on Sundays. Because you're showing an obvious growth. And they're seeing it on, on, in you. And they're curious and they're wondering, if this person can change, I know what he was like. I know I can be better than that. Then it's going to motivate them to want to go and see if they can get some of what you got. Because that's human nature too. If you got something going on in your life and it's good, people will hang around you just to try to get it. They hung around Jesus. Not because they wanted to get saved, but they wanted the, the miracles that Jesus was performing. They wanted to see all the, the miraculous signs that he was doing. They weren't necessarily interested in following Jesus. They weren't interested in saying, Lord, I surrender all to you. Now I will take up my cross and follow you. They weren't, a lot of them weren't interested in doing that. They just wanted to see the miracles of Jesus. They wanted to get the instant healings that Jesus could provide. But most people today are the same way. They want to see all the signs and wonders, but please don't ask me to do anything. I don't want to be involved in ministry. Let those folks who, who like doing that stuff do it. And so that's the same dilemma we are dealing with today. People who don't want to do the work. They want all the blessings, but they don't want to do nothing to work. And people who are in the church are doing all the work. We're saying, we need more workers. We need more laborers in the harvest. It's hard work trying to minister to people and talk to them. And they don't want to hear the gospel. 
But yet you just got to keep on pushing. You got to dust the uh, dirt off your feet and, and let God do the condemning of those individuals who don't want to accept Jesus. Our job, our responsibility is to share the word. Then somebody else will order the word. God will provide the increase. So those people who are truly seeking the Lord, they're going to find him. Because it says in the word, if you're diligently seeking after him, he will show a way. He's going to give more light to those who are looking for the light. But if you're not looking for the light, why should he give you more light? You're not responding to the light he's already given you, and you keep running into the same old ditches because you refuse to look at the light God is showing you, and you wonder why you're in the ditch. Because you're not obeying God's word. God's word will keep you safe. But if you refuse to follow the word, you're going to keep on making the same mistakes over and over again. God will bless your obedience. He will not bless your disobedience. He loves us too much to reward us for doing the wrong things. We don't reward our kids for doing bad things, do we? And we can't possibly love them like our Heavenly Father, who is our, our Heavenly Parent. Who knows the future? Who knows everything about us? Yet we're smart enough not to give kids stuff that they don't deserve. As a parent, you know you don't want to make them worse, so you have to discipline them. You have to say, no, no privileges for you for one month. How do you think I'm going to live without my phone for one month? <laughs> try it. <laughs> Just try it and see what happens and see if you die. And you have to know that, yeah, they ain't going to like it, but you're not here to, to be liked. As a parent, you have to be willing to be uh, make your kids upset with you, angry, talk about you, call your names. They do that. They do that all the time. Because parents aren't perfect, and neither are the kids. Amen. Yeah. I just want to think about what you're talking about is I was at the barbershop yesterday and the subject came up about the church and, and kids. And I was talking to a young man who said, well, I send my kids to Sunday school and church. And I just asked him, I said, well, do you go? <laughs> really? He said, you know, it's good for us as adults to let our children see us pray. They should see us reading our Bible. Right. You know, when we send our kids out, that's, that's good to send them to church in Sunday school, but you need to go with them. Good example. Good point you make it. Yeah, we just can't tell them. We have to show them. We have to be the example that they follow. And uh, once you set the example, uh, even if they don't like it, at least they're going to respect you for it. They respect you for the fact that you're at least willing to put up with what you say you expect from them. Don't be demanding something of others that you're not willing to do yourself. Amen. Amen. And that's the biggest problem a lot of people find us it being in that hypocritical state is, well, you asking me to do something you won't do. And so I, I refuse to do it too. And that's how people are. That's the truth. So getting back to the serpent, and now to the point where a sign for healing, it says, and let me get to my point. The serpent represented our most vile memory of our downfall in the garden. Now the serpent is going to represent our liberation, our freedom. That Jesus had to die on the cross, shed his blood for our sins in order for us to be saved. Now that serpent is representing Christ who had to absorb all our sins. When we look to the cross, we should see that the horror of ourselves. Not that Jesus had to be beaten to a pulp, but he had to be beaten to a pulp because of what we did. Because of our sins. Because of our disobedience. Our unbelief. Jesus had to take all the blows for you, I, and everyone in the world. He had to be the representation to, re to restore our salvation. But we had to do something. We had to look at Jesus Christ. We had to accept Jesus Christ by faith. And by grace alone, we are saved. There's no other way. God has presented the roadmap into our salvation. And we have to share that roadmap with the world so that they can get saved. 
because we're just like those grumbling Israelites in the desert. Why did you bring us all this way, Lord, just for us to die? Because that's how we feel when we're all caught up in our situations. You feel like you're dying on the inside because you can't get the uh, instant results that you desire. You can't get your situation worked out tomorrow. You don't have to have a little faith in the Lord that he's going to work the situation out for you that you can't depend on your own self because that's why you're in the mess anyway. Because you wanted to do it your way. Now that you're getting the, the results of your efforts, you still don't like what you see. Now you've got to trust God. It's going to take some time. God's not going to reward you instantly. You've got to believe that he's going to get you through this. You know what God said? He's not interested in your uh, comfort. God is interested in building your character. So if he'll take you through some struggles, he'll take you through some adversity, he'll take you through some trials, through some tribulation, because in the end what God is trying to build is your faith in him. That you won't rely on your situation and your intellect and your ability to figure things out, which has gotten you in the mess you're in already. He wants you to relinquish and surrender everything. Surrender all. And then come after him and follow. If you're not going to relinquish, you want to hold on to the world and you want to reach out to God and God knows you're holding on to the world, guess what God's going to do? He's going to let go of you. He's going to fall right back into the world's trap. God knows what your motivations are. He knows what your intentions are. He knows what you really plan on doing because he knows everything about us. He said that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. We were shaped in iniquity in our mother's womb. But God knows everything about us and he knows us from the very beginning to the very end. Why can't we trust him? Why is it so hard for us as human beings to relinquish our own free will and surrender it to God's will. And the reason why is because of sin. Sin is attractive. Sin is appealing. Yes. Um, Pastor Pryor at Oasis of Love once said this before he retired. He said, don't hate the sin or hate the sin. Right. Because we're all, we're all sinners. Saved by grace. So we need to hate the behavior. But you love the person. You don't like the person for what they're doing, and you don't like the behavior that they're showing, but you still got to love them. And love them means not deserting them. Loving them means still trying to help them. Loving them means giving them the advice that they don't want to hear. Loving them might even mean helping them out when they're in a bad situation, even though they brought it on themselves. We still don't abandon them. Yes, Kevin. Yeah. I used to have to relate to some of the kids that worked with the star. They would do something. Say, I know you don't like me no more. This time. No, I don't. It's not that I don't like you. I don't like what you did. You hate you. But I still care about right, right. I'm going to help. Hey, man, I was at Star 2. I used to say the same thing. I said, I don't dislike you. I dislike your behavior. And uh, if you change your behavior, guess what? I'm going to like you a whole lot more. But that's a hard message for people to receive because intuitively we know how we think. You do something against me. Not only am I not going to like you, I'm going to try to hurt you. I'm going to get even with you. I'm going to pay back. So they know law, the laws of revenge. They, they, they lived it. So when you see them acting up, they know that they are doing wrong. And they know if you have the opportunity, maybe you're going to make them pay for it. That you're not going to be what you say, uh, forgive me, or graceful. And so as Christians, one of the things we have to learn is how to be graceful to people, how to be respectful, even though they're doing things we don't like, and how to be gentle. We can still get the message across about Jesus, but we've got to be gentle and we've got to be respectful. We can't be dogging people out and expecting them to want to listen to us. We can't be calling them names and cussing them out, because that's not going to impress no unbelievers. They can do that real good, too, on their own. They don't need you to teach them how to cuss you out. <laughs> they can do that by themselves. And better than you most of the time. So be careful what you're saying, all right? So we got to wrap this up because our time is uh, starting to run away. It says, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon the pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, 
when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. How does that relate to us? Because when we behold the precious lamb, the lamb of God, and we believe that he died for our sins, then we can receive the gift of salvation, spiritual life for eternity. The only gift that we really all desire the most is the gift to be able to say we are going to be in heaven with God. And so that's what it's all about, really. It's a spiritual healing. It's not meaning that you're not going to die. Yeah, we're all appointed to die. But then the judgment. And when the judgment comes, that's when Jesus is going to look at us and say, did you trust my son, Jesus? Did you, did you follow him? Did you pick up your cross? Did you, did you help your neighbor? Did you love him more than you loved yourself? Because this is all what we need to be all about as Christians, is loving God and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. So let us put into practice what it is that we need to do. We need to first thank God that he was willing to die for us. We need to show gratitude to Jesus for the price he was willing to pay that we could have never paid. And we have to be able to accept and worship him and be thankful for all that he's done and show the praise that he's worthy of, and to serve him. It should not be a, a grind to serve Jesus. It should be a pleasure. It should be a privilege to know that you're a child of God and you represent him as your servant. To be a servant of the Most High God is a privilege, folks, not a punishment. And too many times we take serving Christ as a punishment. I can't do what I want to do. Well, that's why you were pouring to hell. Because you want to do what you want to do. So, we need to look to the cross and live. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Yes? Uh, question. Uh, I know you, you talk a lot about the cross. Um, can you bring clarity to help me out with this? When Jesus said, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. What do you mean by that? Well, Reb, do you want to try that one? All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I would say this. When he says, because... They don't know him anyway. If they knew Jesus, they would have done what they did. <laughs> but it's because they didn't know who Jesus really was, that he really was the Son of God. That he did come from heaven. He did come for the mission of saving the world from their sins. They had no clue that that was truly the Son of God. And because they thought he was just a joke and was a pretender, they thought, that's why they save yourself, sir. You're on that cross. You're the king of Jews. Let's see you save yourself and get off the cross. That's how people mocked him. They made fun of him because they said, if he's really the son of God, he ain't going to die on that cross. But they didn't know that was the reason he came. He came for our sins, to die for our sins, because we were going to go to hell if he didn't do it. So he said, forgive them. That's what Jesus teaches us. But they know not what they do. That make sense? Any other questions, comments, or answers? Yes. Exactly. You can't wait until God bring it on because it's like, okay, then he only waiting until you get you right. So you're able to accept all of this that you want. Yeah, if, if we was to give our kids everything they wanted right away, we'd be setting them up to go to hell. Mm -hmm. Because the world ain't going to give them what they want. And they ain't going to give it to them right away. Yes. Yes, right. So there's timing involved, right? And we have to do certain things at the right time. Like I wouldn't give uh, uh, certain people in my family keys to my car because, it, like Ella, she wouldn't get the keys to the car by herself. <laughs> hey, no, I'm taking it out for driving. She ain't going to kill herself and some other people out on the road yet, even though she wants to drive. But as a wise grandfather, I know she ain't ready yet. She'll get there in time, a couple more years, she'll be ready. But I'll be darned if she don't get there earlier than 16, because I know she ain't ready. Good point. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Let's bow our heads. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your lesson about look and live. 
Well, we know that there's only one way to, to salvation. And you provided the way when you went to the cross. And Lord, help the world to see uh, through us as we serve you that as Christians, we have given it all to you and are willing to serve you at all costs. That we are totally committed to following you and being obedient servants to you. That you're the boss and you can tell us whatever you want for us to do and we should be willing to do it because you died for us. You who knew no sin became our sin offering so that we could receive the righteousness of God that could not come from us. So, Lord, we thank you for the precious blood that you shed on Calvary for the sins of the world. And because of what you did, Lord, I now can confess that I know you in the pardons of my sin and that I can look to you and I know that I'm going to live an eternal life. I hope that there's not one here under the sound of my voice who has not made that confession, who has not committed their lives to Christ, that before this day is out, when the worship service begins, that you'll be willing to come up and confess your sins and ask God to forgive you and ask for Jesus to come into your life today. And you can, too, receive the gift of eternal life. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us. We can never thank you enough. And Lord, as we get prepared to eat from the breakfast downstairs, we ask that you bless the food that's been prepared for our nourishment as we prepare for an awesome move of your spirit because it's your power that allows us to live. It's your power that gives us eternal life. And it's your power that allowed the Israelites to live in the desert after they had been bitten by the fiery serpents. So Lord, we know, move in your way. Dunamis power is in you, Lord. Dynamite, blow us up from the inside out so that we can be remade and reshape into your image. We thank you now in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Give God a clap for you.